All right, today we're gonna to go over the Dance with Dragons expansion for Game of Thrones. It's for six players only, and it sets the game several turns into the game and reflects the political and character makeup that takes place in the beginning of Dance with Dragons, which is also effectively the beginning of Storm, uh, Feast for Crows. So the political map is adjusted and everyone starts with two or, or, or more castles. The Lannisters start out with King's Landing, Heron Hall, as well as Landis Port, and their empire stretches out across the middle, west to east. High Garden has a massive amount of land as well, also stretching west to east, and is mostly south of the Lannister position, except for the two troops that are north at Crackcrawl Point. There's also a very large fleet stationed outside and surrounding Dragonstone, which is still controlled by the Baratheons in three isolated pockets. They have forces at Dragonstone, at Storm's End, and at Castle Black, <clears throat> and in other northern territories, as well as some sea units there. The Baratheons are in a very precarious position, as they are in the books in this situation, and are completely cut off from being able to send reinforcements to each other, and are very isolated. The Starks have been all but defeated, and politically destroyed, and their deck is now been taken over by Freys and by Boltons, and they control Winterfell, White Harbor, Moat Cannon, and other northern territory. The Martells are the only ones that have an entirely logical and easy defense of relatively simple borders of only two territories that face the other other nations. The Greyjoys are entirely composed on the western side of the map and have several coastal territories and a large fleet along the entire Summer Sea. They're in a position to either attack the Boltons, the Lannisters, High Garden, or even the Dornish. And a Greyjoy character in this one will do wise to choose one or two of those, but definitely not all three. And that's the political makeup of all the new families. This game is shorter than the other versions, but definitely more complicated. Everyone starts out with more armies and more territories. It's essentially you're walking in on a game that someone else played for you. And if you had played this game and played it a thousand times, no one in their right mind would ever recreate the political maps that you see in front of us. But that just proves that the characters in the books are making mistakes and doing dumb things. The Lannisters are very spread out and defenseless against their High Garden allies. And High Garden has a lot of territory, but his castle short and is posed to take castles from foes like the Baratheons, or maybe they turn on their Lannister allies. The Baratheons are disjointed and they have two very important political castles and yet their main army is north in the wastelands. The Greyjoys actually have somewhat of a logical position that they're going to be pirates and raiders as they have a strong navy and they can move their army around to wherever they want it. By setting yourself up with three foes and no natural allies, they're going to have to make a decision quickly of who they're going to fight against and who they're going to recruit in their help. The Martells would actually happen. It makes sense where they are. They're in their own territory. And maybe this shows that at this point in the books, the Martells are the ones that have their, their stuff together the most, and maybe they'll end up doing much better. 
The Starks are gone, and the Boltons and the Freys are actually in a relatively good position as long as they keep their alliances and focus on taking out the last Greyjoy troops on their northern soil, but at the same time they have to contend with the large Baratheon army that's north of them, and they should try to expel it as soon as possible. We'll go over some of the family cards that is particularly unique and individual, and I'll go ahead and start with the Lannisters. Their most powerful card with a combat strength of four is now Sir Jamie Lannister, which at this point in the books, spoiler alert for the rest of these family cards, are going to reflect the political and character makeup of the book and show at this point. With Tywin dead, Sir Jamie Lannister is now is now without a hand, but definitely wiser than he was before and shows that he's a better military commander than he was before. Sir Kevin Lannister, the loyal uncle, is their three value with a single fortification icon. Sir Ilan Payne is still their executioner and he's their level two. His text ability reads, if you win this combat, you may destroy one of your opponent's footmen in any area in addition to normal casualties. If that unit is the last unit in the area, you also get to remove the order token that was there as well. So that's particularly useful. This would actually be a great way to rob them of a power token or a support or, or well, I guess raids would already be resolved. But this would be best to take out an isolated footman in a territory and force them to have to move a new one there later. Their first number one card is Sir Adam Maravan, who, if you're attacking all your participating knights, including supporting Lannister knights, add plus three combat strength instead of two. So this is a very similar card to what Sir Kevin Lannister was in the last one in the base version of the game while he is the one that you want to hold in reserve for when you have a large knight army. Cersei Lannister is number one and has a one fortification, a very bare bones card, not particularly interesting. And Devin Lannister is their level two with a single sword icon. Corban is their zero, but has a very sneaky text ability. You may discard two of your available power tokens and choose a house card in any player's discard pile. Corban gains the permanent combat strength and combat icons of that card, annoying, um, ignoring its text ability. So essentially, you get to bring any family member of your foes back from the dead. If you want to bring Stannis Baratheon back from the dead and have him fight for you, or Mace Tyrell, or all these other, or any other family card, you don't get their text ability. But if you want some fortification symbols, or if you want a level four combat, or just a bunch of swords, you just need to look around in the discard pile and see who would you would like to bring back to life. This is a very interesting card and it kind of reflects the Frankenstein monster that we that most people believed <clears throat> Sir Robert Strong or aka the Mountain to be. The next family deck I'm going to go through is the Tyrells of Highgarden. Their highest card is Mace Tyrell. He's level 4. He's a single sword and a fortification icon. Pretty straightforward. Randall Tarly is Two swords and a th value of three. Sir John Fosway is a single sword and two combat strength. Willis Tyrell is two combat strength and a single fortification. Paxter Redwine, his text ability is, if an embattled area is a sea area, all of your participating ships, including supporting Tyrell ships, add plus two combat instead of plus one. That is a very valuable card and should be used in any sea battle that the Tyrells find themselves in. Queen of Thorns 
is the number one is the number one text to build a uh, number one combat strength but her text says ignore all text abilities printed on your opponent's card which could be very useful if you're going against some of these more tricky um, enemies this is a very valuable card and then Marjorie Tyrell is the value zero but if you're defending your home area or an area that contains one of your power tokens your opponent's final combat strength is two this is an amazing card this is essentially one that you always need to keep in your back pocket whenever one of your main territories is being threatened of siege you keep this and you make sure you will have a combat value of at least two if you're higher than them on the track ideally three and you can never lose just keep this card and you'll always be able to defend your castle at least once and then unfortunately this will go in your discard pile and it'll attack again but this is an amazing card for defense make sure you hold on to her next we'll talk about the dornish house martel oh and something about the tyrells you would notice that the knight of flowers is no longer included in their deck he's very much alive at this point in the books but he's a king's guard and therefore is no longer a political player in the tyrell family now going back to martel and the dornish Duran Martel is their strongest leader at a tax value of, of a combat strength of four. For each house card in your hand, this card gains a fortification icon and suffers negative one combat strength to a minimum of zero. So this is a very interesting slash conflicting card. So you would want to use this in different situations if you have this as your last hand the last card in your hand you go ahead and use this if you want to get the four value however if you just want as many fortification or sword icons if you want if you believe you're going to win no matter what and you want to cause as many casualties as you can or if you know you're going to lose and you want to avoid as many casualties as you can, then you would use this card. So it's definitely a little bit of, requires more strategy than most level 4 cards that you just like to throw out whenever you want. But this level 4 can end up being a 0 if you do it at the wrong time. So be very wary of this card and use it at its best times. Area Hota. He's three and he has two fortifications, a very solid card. Big man who, I'm not exactly sure who they're referring to. Um, like I haven't read Dance of Dragons in quite a while. Is a combat strength of two and a single sword icon. Bastard of God's Grace, he's two and a fortification. Quentin Martel is a one. And for each house card in your discard pile, this card, this card gains one combat strength. So again, the Martells, they have interesting cards. It requires a little bit more strategy, but it really pays off. So this combat value of one, if you make it your last, if you make it your last one, it's going to have a combat value of six, or it's actually seven, because it's plus one for each one in your discard pile. So you would want to use this as after as many other cards have been used as possible. Sir Garrus Drinkwater is their combat one. If you win this combat, you may move one position higher on one influence tract of your choice. This is a great one if you know you're going to have a guaranteed win or a small win. Go ahead and give yourself that extra political bonus afterwards. In the Myria Sand is a zero and she has a single sword and a single fortification a very uh, most zeros have a uh, text ability but i guess from her failed princess kidnapping coup that her strategy isn't all as isn't as good as the rest of her family the baratheon stannis baratheon is still their number four 
deck just like he was in the base version. However, if you have the text, this time his text ability is different. If you are not being supported in this combat, remove all support orders, including your own, adjacent to the embattled area, canceling any supporting strength that they have been providing. So essentially, if you're not being supported or if your enemy is supporting more than you are getting support, you get to go ahead and neutralize everyone else's support. This is a very valuable card, particularly if the Brathians want to take Winterfell. It takes away the support ability of other adjacent territories. Their level 3 card is Jon Snow. If you win this combat, you may decrease or increase the wildling track by one space to a minimum of zero and a maximum of ten. This is a really interesting card because one, it's a three, but in terms of either strengthening, you would wonder why would anyone do that? And so that's why I'm going to skip ahead to the Mance Raider card, which is also in the Baratheon deck. Your final combat strength is equal to the current position of the Wildling Threat token. So with Jon Snow and Mance Raider in coronation, you could increase the strength of the Wildlings, and then Mance Raider could use that as their final combat strength. So you could have an army that's a value of 10, even though if it's just one person. So... If you save this Mance Raider card for the right moment, you can have a massive army on your hands. The Bastard of Night Song is a level 2 with a fortification. This time, Melisandre is a level 2 instead of a level 1 like she was in the base version, and she has a text ability. After combat, you may return any house card in your discard pile, including this card, into your hand, by discarding a number of power tokens equal to the printed combat strength of that card. So essentially you get to bring one family member of your choice back from the dead. Which could be particularly useful because with Mance Raider, a combat strength of zero, you can go ahead and use him two times back to back to each other by having him go use that card up. Then use Melisandre, bring them back for free, and then have them attack again. It's a really powerful card combination. And if a good strategist uses it with good timing, it'd be devastating. And your enemies probably aren't going to be in, be able to anticipate that. Um, Sir Davis Seaworth is your number one with a single sword and a fortification. And Sir Axel Florent is their number one with a single sword. I really wish Sir Davos would get a little bit of a cooler text ability or power since I think he's a really interesting character and one of the smarter strategists uh, in the Baratheon family, but oh well. I'm just really glad that Melisandre got something that is more useful than she was in the base deck. Next, we'll go over to Greyjoys, who their most powerful character is Aaron Crozai. He's a level 4, and if your opponent is higher positioned in the Fiefdom's Influence track, this card gains plus 1 combat strength. So this is actually very similar to the base game Stannis Baratheon card that would give you one more strength if the person was higher on the Iron Throne. This time it's the Fiefdom's track. So if you're a Greyjoy, you may actually strategically want to not bid too high on the Fiefdom track. The next one is Victarion Greyjoy. He's a level 3 with two sword icons. Very straightforward. Asha Greyjoy is a level 2 with a single fortification. Roderick the Reader is a level 2 with the text ability of If you win this combat, you may search any Westeros deck of your choice. Shuffle the remaining cards and place a chosen card face down on the top of the deck. So essentially, you get to predict the future of one aspect of the Westeros deck. Do you want to bid for the influence track? 
Do you want to make sure you're guaranteed to get a mustering? Do you want supplies to be redistributed? This is a very powerful card, but you got to remember this is only when you win the combat. So this could be very useful, but make sure you win the combat. Sir Haggis Hair Law is a one and a single sword. And Carl the Maid is a one with the text ability of if you're attacking and lose this combat, gain three power tokens. So this is the definitional sacrificial lamb. You may want to, <laughs> you would most likely use this against someone that you have no intention of beating and you're just doing this for these three power tokens. Aaron Dampair is their level zero combat strength character. And his text ability is you may discard any number of your available power tokens to increase the combat strength of this card by the number of power tokens discarded. So this is actually a good way to guarantee a victory if you're rich enough. So before you use this card, make sure you have the number of power tokens that you need to ensure a victory. Lastly, we have the deck that's still called the Stark deck, but is obviously the Boltons. And their most powerful card is Roos Bolton. He's a text ability four with a single sword icon. Nothing all that fancy there. Ramsey Bolton is a level three whose text ability reads, if Reek house card is still in your hand, this card gains one combat strength and three sword icons. This is really valuable. So you just gotta keep Reek in your hand and this family deck essentially has two four combat strength cards rather than just one like all the others. Their level twos are Walter Frey and Steel Shanks Walton. They're one sword and one fortification icon respectively. Dance for me is their level one with a sword icon. Their next number one is Walter Frey with a very interesting text ability. Any player other than your opponent who grants support to your opponent must grant that support to you instead. So essentially, if you're attacking a player and that defending character or that person's attacking you whoever your enemy is if there's a third party that's supporting them you get to turn that support and instead of helping them they're now helping you you're essentially forcing the other player to betray their their spoken ally so make sure you hold on to this and it could be particularly valuable particularly if your enemies do not know in that they're depending on support. Reek, he's their level zero character and is if your Ramsey Rolton house card is in your discard pile, immediately return him to your hand. If you lose this combat, you may return Reek back to your hand. So this is a this is a good combination. Go ahead and always use Ramsey first, and then you will get him to be the four combat strength that you want. And then, win or lose, go ahead and use Reek, and then you'll get your Ramsey Bolton back again. And if you lose, you go ahead and get Reek again, and you can start the combo all, all over again, and keep on using four text ability that your enemies normally can't. And that is all the new family cards for the expansion Dance with Dragons. I hope you found this video to be helpful. Go ahead and look at the map yourselves before you start the game. Try to figure out based off of which family you are. Again, the same rules apply. The, the most basic premise still applies. You have to choose one of your neighbors as your friend and your other neighbor as your foe. However, in this version of the game, you probably have more than two neighbors. You're going to have to have at least one of them be your enemy. But maybe you can have two allies now. Or maybe you're going to have two enemies. But try to figure that out. There's some 
enemies that are completely unavoidable. The Martells and the Tyrells seemed doomed to fight each other because the Dornish territory is completely and utterly surrounded by the, the Tyrells, except for the one Baratheon stony shore. For this reason, the Tyrells may be able to place the Dornish by offering to help them take Storm's End in order for a temporary peace. Otherwise, the Dornish are going to go ahead and attack the very vulnerable areas that in turn one are completely undefended by the Tyrell family. But this will allow the Tyrell family to use their fleet in their night and maybe counterattack in different territories. So that's one natural enemy. The Baratheons, their natural enemy is going to be the Boltons in which moving south to Winterfell is probably the best hope of strategy that they'll have since it's unlikely that they'll be able to hold, hold on to Storm's End. They could possibly hold on to Dragonstone if they can get a fleet down soon enough to the Narrow Sea to at least raid the support icons of the Tyrell fleet. The Lannisters are in a relatively strong position and they should try to hold on to King's Landing as much as they can as well as River Run and Lannisport. Their strategy should probably be to hold, try to hold on to the territories that they have and wait and see which enemies are weakened by turn one. The Greyjoys, like I mentioned before, should choose one or two enemies and focus on them by making peace with one of them. They could actually agree to work with the Baratheons to defeat the Boltons, possibly by guaranteeing that they get some northern territory if the Baratheons get to keep Winterfell or something along that line. Or maybe they'll agree to work with the Lannisters and take... Bolton territory or take Highgarden territory in the position to attack nearly anywhere they want with a mass massive range compared to most other players and the Boltons are a little vulnerable their their biggest problems are going to be the Baratheons to their north and maintaining their alliance with the Lannisters to the south but they should try to move into the Erie as soon as possible since that's one of the few territories that are, are still up for the taking. And that concludes my video for Dance of Dragons. I hope this has been helpful. I really enjoyed this version of the game. It takes a little bit shorter than the base version but a little bit more chaotic. And the family cards are definitely at a higher strategy level than the base level. But if you enjoy the base game, I think you'll enjoy this as well. But I can still I still continue to play the base version if I want to have a simpler game. Alright, thank you. Bye.